Welcome to the podcast. I am your host, Tom Boyd. This is the show where we discover how storytellers are building brands online. And today is a special one. We talk to my friend, Jules Montgomery. She is a creator, an educator, and an entrepreneur. We talk about the first company she started that saw six figures within two months of launching it, how she started her own influencer agency, what she would do differently in her earliest brand deals, why she's starting the glass door for influencers and creators. We talk about exactly how brands should be working with creators and how you should reach out to brands and what you should include in your media kit. But before we get into the show, a word from our sponsor. Something we talk about a lot on this podcast is monetization of your content as a storyteller. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumanu. This is the platform that I use that makes working with brands and getting paid easier so I can focus my time doing what I enjoy the most, creating content and connecting with you. You've heard me talk a lot about how we need to stop working with brands as one-off transactions rather seek to build a relationship with them well the best way you build a relationship is through effective communication and Lomano has a collabs feature that simplifies the communication process with the brand you are working with so imagine having email Google Docs Dropbox and payments all in one place so when it comes to expectations deliverables and timing you can literally stay on the same page with the brand you are working with also you can request and receive your payment from the brand partners for no fees. So when you request your hard-earned bread through Lumanu, an invoice is generated and sent right to your client's inbox. They are then able to pay you out with one click of a button. So stop using PayPal to send invoices unless you're selling your used air conditioner to your neighbor and start treating your creator business like a professional and price what you deserve at Lumanu.com. When I look at your content, I see someone that is very comfortable with what you're talking about like i like you know how a lot of creators are out there and you feel like they're kind of forcing it just to say it just to put it out there there's nothing forced about your your presence online and so i know that there's more there like i want to and i want to know about what's more there and so how did this begin like wh- how did you get so comfortable at where you're at now um it's funny that you mentioned the way that certain creators can feel forced and sometimes um you can look a lot more comfortable. And that was, there was definitely a learning curve there. Mm -hmm. Um, So a few things happened. Um, A while ago, while I was running my influencer marketing agency, I realized the power of having a platform, but I wasn't sure um, what part of my life could um, lend itself to content creation. So I kind of tested everything. I gave business tips, uh, tips for influencers, brands. I even did some of the like cheesy put a finger down challenge stuff you got to you got you got to experiment <laughs> it's like a rite of passage yep. um and that was definitely very uncomfortable looking and i think that came through on camera i'm not like the personality lifestyle creator girl that just never fit me um so once i started creating with my expertise and just talking about what I knew within the brand deal space and helping influencers, uh, it became a lot more natural. But even then, I remember the first couple weeks of creating that type of content. Um, I would watch my videos back and be like, why does it sound like I'm whispering? I swear, I, like I've got to mm. scream to sound like I'm talking at a normal volume. So learning to get comfortable on camera is just a matter of creating a ton, posting a ton and refining as you go. And getting a sense for what you truly care about. I Absolutely. think that I, I, when people ask me, hey, how do I become better on camera? I'm like, honestly, w- reps and finding what it is you really care about because it'll light you up. Like you can't fake that unless you're an actor or an actress. You can't you can't fake that enthusiasm. So you talked about your influencer agency. How did you get into – so uh, let's go back to there. Like how did you start an influencer agency? Are we backing it up all the way? To yeah, like- yeah. Let's back it up. Let's back <laughs> it up. So you you started e- even before that with your building your own company online. Yeah. And so okay. So I, for a long time, tried to make healthcare work. Um, just heard from a lot of external influences that that was the way to go. So um, I actually studied nursing at and, and then worked at University of Michigan. Worked at Cleveland Clinic. Um, it absolutely was not for me. And, um, on the side there, I started an e-commerce business and it was selling athleisure and I scaled it to six figures in about two months through organic social media 
Um, <laughs> How? <laughs> Wait, two months. Campaign. Two months from like idea to like, like you had the idea, and two months later, you got six figures. No, <laughs> two months from the launch, like launch of, of it. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's talk about that. Let's go into that because I think that that's some, so important to uh to like what you're building now. Okay, for sure. So um, I was looking for something to prove to myself that I could do business. I always kind of had an interest in business, um, kind of wanted to study it in school, just didn't listen to myself. And so I thought, let's find out if I'm actually good at this. Let's find if I can sell, find out if I can sell to people. So I ended up um, just like sourcing some basic athleisure products and um, posting that, like taking pictures of myself in them and none of them had my face in it it was just like me wearing the sweatshirts oh. and the sweatpants and stuff um some self-timer photography put it all over instagram and then the first thing that i did was reach out to people who were commenting on posts of similar brands and similar products asking for restocks and i was sending them discount codes uh it was very scrappy mm, yep <laughs> and then I quickly moved to influencer marketing. I realized that was the way to make money. Um, I was running Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, that was just self-taught through YouTube. Self-taught everything. Yes. There's so yeah. much information online. You can learn how to do almost anything. But Any, Like all, whenever you want, like on the drop of a dime, like I want to learn this thing. There's someone probably teaching it out there. Right. It's amazing. So I remember finding a few people who were teaching Facebook and Instagram ads on YouTube for free. And I was like, let's find out if these people are lying. I'm just going to try it myself. An experiment. And yeah. Just and going. it was it was all totally working. And I remember seeing a video from one of the guys who was like, yeah, I see these comments asking, like, if it was that easy, why would I be telling everyone how to do it? And he said, because no one will do it. He's like, mm. <laughs> I get views and no one actually takes action so i was like challenge yeah. accepted <laughs> i love it i love it i see that a lot too like some people uh they'll roast people that that you know I, I, there's obviously a lot of people out there that that do have courses that are scams but there's i feel like there's also a lot of like that's this true for any industry mm -hmm. like the beverage industry the book and like the, you know a lot of people are just selling nonsense but then, then there's a lot of just great quality teachers online and some people they're good at something and they just have this need this this calling to want to teach it and share it so yeah you found you found some people teaching this online mm -hmm. you're free like did you any paid courses or is this all just youtube educate youtube university right now <laughs> youtube university i actually just didn't even come across any courses that were yeah. teaching what i was interested in learning but i did find a handful of uh youtube videos from people who were running e-commerce stores and just showing the behind the scenes of how they did that um so watched a bunch of those videos and then for the influencer marketing side um i had always been a huge consumer um, of influencer content. So I kind of had an idea of what sold and who did a really great job of connecting with their audiences, mm -hmm. reached out to a bunch of those creators and offered them free product. And it wasn't an exchange for anything. It was just, let me gift this to you. And I would just put together really cute packages with like handwritten notes. And mm. <laughs> I just like made them with love. And small businesses, who do that generally have really great success, especially with micro and mid-sized influencers of getting posts, even if they're just story posts. Um, it's a great start uh, because most of the influencers that I've encountered really do like supporting small businesses, um, especially with on-brand um, on brand content. Yep. Yeah, and then you can also use those first couple, a handful of people that are engaging, screenshot it, and then you leverage that to get bigger influencers, and then it just kind of keeps going from there. Exactly. So, so you're you're what a month or two in, and do, does like one post go viral to lead it to a bunch of sales, or is it kind of everything together? Like, where's most of the the exposure coming in from? TikTok. This is where I realized the power of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're so big into TikTok. Let's go. <laughs> yes. Um, so Instagram was going really well. Sales were starting to pick up. Um, I was shocked that anyone was purchasing anything from me. I was like, oh, my God, they want my, my clothes. Yeah. Um, and I was really happy with that. And I actually ended up sending gifted products to a girl. And it was just for an Instagram um, 
like I had just seen her Instagram. It was, it was just a gift. And I thought her Instagram was great. And she ended up creating a TikTok video for me. And I just didn't even, I didn't even have TikTok at the time. She was like, Hey, I made a TikTok for you. And I was like, I'll download the app so I can see it. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like I should shout her out because it was so awesome. Let's Um, do it. It's Lindsay Reinstra. She was one of my best influencers ever for myself or any brand I've represented like to date. Um, she made a TikTok video doing, um, a, she did, I think, two dancing in these sweatpants and they were in really high demand at the time. They were tie dye. That was like mm. all the rage during the pandemic. And her TikTok drove like 10 grand in sales. One video. I was like, Okay, so we're doing all TikTok influencers now. Was she linked to it? (laughs) Did she put a link in her profile? Um, People started commenting. So she just like did it to be nice and then she tagged me in the caption. And I had um, just like, I made a a, a TikTok for this brand, but um, I didn't post on it at all. She just, it was all she could find to tag me with. And so then people were just like going back to my Instagram and finding the store and shopping. And she That's was commenting, wild. telling everyone where, like, commenting the website to people because they were asking. I love that story. I lo- <laughs> like because that I see that same thing playing out. So this company, Poppy, Drink Poppy. Yeah. They sent me two cases of Poppy, and like, like I buy Poppy all the time, but for some reason I'm just like I want to put it in my video now. Like I have them all like right here. They have hundreds of thousands of videos because like they, it adds up over time. But I think you're right. Like smaller brands that like. I mean, they, they have a budget now, but like they're, you know, they're not paying me because I'm small time for them probably, <laughs> but, but like, um, we'll get to that point. But right now I'm just like, yeah, this is fun. Like I like the collaboration. I want to show a, a case study of how I can support a brand. Yeah. I think that's actually, um, really interesting that you brought up Poppy of all things, because I feel like the future for influencers is becoming the brands themselves and getting behind the brands that they love and having actual stake in the game. So uh, mm. Poppy, I believe, aren't they backed by Animal? Um, or they have like Josh Josh Richards uh, involved? They might. They might. Yeah, they definitely I wouldn't do. be surprised. They, they seem tapped in to the influencer scene. They definitely um, do. They have influencers for investors. And I think that's really huge because paid ad is so expensive. Inauthentic partnerships are instantly seen through. And the like one of the best possible ways to get these influencers authentically endorsing things is having them, you know, actually have stake in, in the success of the businesses. Let's see. So you're two months in and what makes you pivot and then start your own influencer uh, agency? And then, and then from there, how do you leapfrog to what you're doing now? Yeah. So, um, I pretty quickly quit my job in healthcare because I was making so much more doing this other stuff. I was running a business. I was like, this is a dream come true. Were were you solo at that point? Did you have like a virtual assistant or anything? I I can't say that I didn't force my sister to help me during the pandemic. (laughs) And also- We all do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So were you, no, tell me this, were you packaging and shipping out everything or was it, was it like drop shipping? Uh, We were packaging and shipping out. So actually like at one point- (laughs) That's why <laughs> um, no one could get stock in any of this stuff. I had an order pending for six months plus. It was truly insane um, from overseas. I, I, I didn't diversify my supply chain. Everything was being made in China. The pandemic obviously hit China really hard um, and I wasn't able to get any stock. So we bought a ton of white sweatpants and I paid my sister to dye them in our parents' bathtub. And at one point we were even dying open bottom sweatpants and people wanted joggers. So I was taking a seam ripper and opening up the bottom and then threading elastic through with a safety no pin. No way. I swear. And sewing it. I learned to sew for this. <laughs> now, how, what's the time frame of this? So like how, like, so you started, how many months in are you now making your own homemade <laughs> sweatpants in the bathtub? Like uh, just like five months in, or are you still is this like two three months in at this point? This was just a few months in, so it happened really yeah. really quickly. So like everything, it, it took off so fast, and the pandemic yeah. timed up really well with it. And I had just quit my job, and I was like, everything was ro- like going so so well. Um, conversions were so cheap on ads; it was like four dollars for a conversion on a hundred twenty dollar order. 
um, and margins were great. Um, but that was, I did that from around April, 2020, March, 2020, maybe to July, 2020, when okay. I could actually no longer even get my hands on the plain white sweatpants because Jersey's textile mill was shut down. So COVID really disrupted everything. Yep. So it was a good thing that I was at that point transitioning into the influencer marketing space and running campaigns. That so, off. <laughs> so you were working with it. So after that first influencer, you did you see that and say, okay, how do I duplicate that? And like, what's the process that you put in place to start working with more influencers? Um, so I honestly was just in the beginning reaching out to so many people because it was all very elusive to me at the time. I had no idea how to get in touch with creators. And I was just going to the people that I already followed. So there were already a lot of fashion lifestyle creators. Yeah, exactly. And DMing a whole bunch of people. And usually with creators, if you, especially because the tie dye sweats were in really high demand, everyone wanted them during the pandemic. Um, it was pretty easy to form partnerships. So I think product market fit is really underestimated with influencer partnerships. If you have something that people want, it's a lot easier to partner with quality influencers. <laughs> Here's a question. I got a question. I have a lot of questions. I, this is this is fascinating to me. So, um, because I, here's the thing: a lot of people have ideas. Like a lot of people probably had the same idea, <laughs> but like I'm always fascinated when people actually do them. You know, and, and like and like test it because it's hard. You know, do how do you know how much to buy at the beginning? You know, do you sell just uh, like at the beginning? Did you just sell like a? Did you just make a mock up and sell air? And then like once you got that money coming in, then got the product like. Like, like, like what, what did you do for the, the first batch of in inventory? Um, so a few things I have definitely been the person with the idea who didn't go through with it. Yeah. Um, multiple times. I actually have a couple interesting stories there. Number one, I am super into skincare just as like a, a side hobby thing. And I read Korean skincare blogs because Korea <laughs> I love it. knows skincare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I actually read about jade rollers before anyone knew about them here. Is that like the things that like you roll on your face? Yes. And I would, I had a bunch of them, like $350 of them in my cart on Alibaba. And I was like, these are going to be huge in the U S because anything that pops off in Korean skincare ends up huge in the U S a year or two later. Um, so I was completely ready to, to go through with that, but I was still in college and I was like, eh, I'd be really mad if I lost $350. That's like a few days of work for me at the time, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which in hindsight, I'm like, no. Yeah. Um, but so I've definitely been the person who didn't execute. So then when I, I saw the opportunity here, I was like, I'm just doing it. I'm not letting paralysis by analysis yep. get the best of me. I think that's people's biggest issue in business and content creation and everything. It's you taking the first step. Keep, right. People want to know what the result is going to be before they start. And you're just you never going to, it's never yeah. going to work like that. Yep. Um, cool. so, so, so you yeah, just with trusted the, it. You were like, let, let's run it. Um, I didn't uh, trust gonna... it. I just sent it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I guess there's a difference. There's definitely a difference. All right. So, you're working with the influencers now. You're you're employing that, and then you start to see. You start to see. Oh, these influencers are making a lot of money too in this in this world. And you're like, your eyes are starting to say like, oh, maybe maybe I could start you know getting into that lane myself. So at this time, I'm thinking I, I see the value of a platform. I'm like, wow, these influencers are really wielding a lot of power, and yeah. I would love to build a community about something that I care about. So I, I tested a whole bunch of different things. Skincare for one. I made skincare content at one point. I was just testing to see what would work for me, but nothing came really naturally other than educating on like business in the influencer space. So once I started creating that influencer content on TikTok, um, which the biggest goal for this at the time was just bring on new brands and new creators for the agency. So I was just trying to speak to that audience. And one video in particular, I remember blew up and it was, there was a trend going around called pictures of me that went viral on Pinterest check. And mm. these girls would flex all these pictures of themselves that went viral on Pinterest. And I made a video saying, you guys realize this isn't like paparazzi 
involved like they're just posting their own pictures to pinterest yeah <laughs> and he here's how you can link your instagram to pinterest to do the same thing and that video got around a million views and i had no followers at the time and i was just hooked so I, it you, was... that's a that's an interesting angle so a trend was happening you didn't do the trend you added commentary to the trend yeah and in that people saw your way of thinking and mm -hmm. then they like in the way of thinking in markets like what you're all about and then people follow you and you start to build your own platform yes and there's always an opportunity for that i can't i i think i followed probably five to ten creators for their comedic commentary on the couch guy situation yep <laughs> so there's always an opportunity with a really big trend to like add to it but use your specific angle you don't necessarily have to jump on the trend in the traditional sense yep yep you don't have to be doing the dance or mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay that's good to know so the agency i'm sorry we're bopping around um like <laughs> you got that you got that when you started the agent so you at what point are you like how do you start getting influencers that you're representing do you just say hey i want to represent you you'll get a cut like let's go you know how, how does so it start so I was actually running influencer campaigns for brands. So I had some friends who had businesses and I was like, Hey, this is how you should be doing your influencer marketing. And at this point I had a spreadsheet of creators and their contact information that was really quickly growing. And I was sorting everyone by niche and I was able to start to quickly match up, um, businesses with creators who would reach their target audience. And I did a mix of that, and then like the creative direction side. So as I started working with bigger brands, you would have more people with opinions coming in saying, mm -hmm. we want the influencer to hold up the product in their yep. right hand and repeat, repeat the name of the brand three times. Um, <laughs> so I was the person to kind of say, that's not TikTok. Nah, and it's not Gen Z convert. will reject yeah. that. <laughs> yep. Um, so I started building that out and that kind of coincided with my TikTok content creation. Um, so I was, I was doing it freelance at the time, creating content around it. And then it just kind of grew really quickly. And I started to hire a few people for the agency and that became my full-time thing for a little over a year, a year and a half. And then for a few months prior to that, like as a, a freelance thing. So are you still doing any of that now? Um, so I'm not physically running the campaigns for the brands anymore. I used yeah. to do all of the influencer matching, the back and forth, the payment, which was chaotic to say the least. Um, I transitioned out of that and I'm still doing creative direction and consulting for brands um, and helping them find the right influencers. I'm just not doing the manual outreach portion. So now we're building our own platform. Now we're like, you know... I sold the sweatpants. I helped influencers connect with brand, but now I want to run a, a, a tech company. I want, I want a startup. <laughs> like, tell me, tell me, all right, again, wh why is this so important for you to come in and help creators in their relationships with brands? All right. Um, this is going to be more articulate than those previous few stories I told because I've been telling this story a lot for the last few it, weeks yeah, yeah yeah so if you are an investor get your check out <laughs> <laughs> all right here comes my pitch um, let's do it so influencers are free agents so their rates have always varied and this was apparent when i was running instagram campaigns but the discrepancies in what creators were charging started to really glare when I transitioned over to TikTok. So once mm -hmm. Lindsay posted that video, I started moving to TikTok. I started bringing, like, convincing brands to come over to TikTok because the reach on that platform is just insane. Um, but creators were growing so quickly that so a bunch of them didn't know what their market value mm -hmm. uh, values were. So I would work with two creators, each with a, a million followers, similar engagement rates and niches, and one would be charging a few hundred per post and the other would be charging a few thousand per post. And they'd mm -hmm. each be getting it. So I, that kind of piqued my interest. I did a little bit of research, realized there wasn't a great uh, industry standard. There was really nowhere to see what you should be getting paid as a creator. So that was a bit frustrating. But then once my audience grew to the point that brands were reaching out to me personally, 
Um, then the, the pain point became a little bit more personal. I was like, okay, mm. I've accepted a few brand deals I shouldn't have taken. I talked to creator friends about it and realized that I was severely underpaid. <laughs> and now I'm frustrated. And mm. I put an Airtable form in my bio and I made a couple TikToks about it. And I said, hey, go fill out the form in my bio and tell me about the brand deals that you've done. Tell me how much you've gotten paid, your story is good and bad. And then I'll publicize all the information so you guys can see what your peers are being paid. And I wasn't sure if people were going to be willing to go through the trouble of filling out that form. But within around four weeks, we had over 3000 brand reviews. And I saw that I, I had something, I really identified a pain point and could possibly make a difference. Ooh, I love that story. <laughs> Thank you. See, I that one was that. a little bit more refined. Yeah, no, no. So it it's dialed in, but it's for me, I'm listening to it because that's exactly where I am. People are now saying, uh, hey, we'll pay you to do a, a 15 second video. And for me, I'm like, man, like that's actually a wild concept that I'm building my own platform. And then someone's going to say, hey, just talk about us. But then there's a lot of things involved, you know, the trust with your audience, you know, there's uh, if I hold out on this one, can I charge double on the next one? You know, mm -hmm. and there's so many questions that I have. So luckily, because of this TikTok community and this creator community uh, that is so helpful, like meeting guys like JT, uh, you know, other creators that, uh, you know, I just call them and say, hey, what should I charge for this? And they're like, go a little higher, go, a little, you know, like, because people know this world, but basically what you're saying is you're building that world. So even if you don't have the, the group around you, you people are going to have access to this type of content and they're going to know how to, how to charge when they start getting those brand deals rolling in. Right. And you made a great point that something that people really often take advantage of is that early excitement when you become a content creator and brands first start reaching out to you. It's easy to be taken by that. I know I was. When a brand first reached out to me and said they'd pay me for a video, I was like, you'll pay me to do what I'm already doing? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Just to build my own platform? Like, oh, yeah, let's, right. let's go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I was excited and I pretty much just accepted it with no negotiation. And that's something a lot of creators do because it is really cool. It's it's a realized dream for a lot of people to have brands reaching out to them. Um, and so that's something that I want to prevent. And then to your point of having resources and people that you can reach out to, that tends to be really concentrated among certain areas. So New York and LA, those creators generally charge what they're worth or closer to what they're worth. Yep. Across the rest of the world, people don't necessarily have huge communities that they can reach out to. And so this further perpetuates minority creators being paid less than their white counterparts who have access yep. to tons of other creators that they can ask about what they should be charging. So I think that democratizing access to that and just creating transpar transparency for everyone is extremely important. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you mentioned, uh, I think I might have saw on the deck or on the website is it's creator first. Is, would you say that that's the main difference between this and maybe other platforms in this in these spaces? Uh, I feel like there's a couple out there that are kind of saying that they're they're doing this, but I don't know how many creators are actually using them. Mm -hmm. So the big picture for Influent is that we serve creators with all of these tools and we give them. Um, basically we take care of them. Like the creators are going to be our priority as a platform and none of the existing, and then we'll charge brands to post campaigns on the platform to access this talent pool of influencers, but we're never going to charge influencers. Um, because again, it. It, it's so difficult to be a free agent and you're the little guy, right? We're getting brand reviews from McDonald's and L'Oreal and all of these massive companies that have the budgets to pay these freelancers that don't even yeah that have budgets so big that like they like forget that they're even working with certain influencers you know and right. for this for the smaller influencer it's game changing like that one brand deal can give them the, the you know the 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 runway to create content for three months that then mm -hmm. builds their audience another hundred thousand so yeah, it's we're let's say we're a year into this platform. Someone has a has a video go viral. They have a hundred thousand followers now. 
let's let's talk through their like customer journey of using your platform like what like i know it's not built yet and like it's in the process but like mm-hmm. what in, in ideal sense like what is this what is this girl gal or girl getting out of the platform when they when they sign up to influent so ideally they come to influent they make their account they are able to see immediately what their market value is based on their follower count their engagement rate their niche Um, and they're able to have a really good idea of how much they can be charging these brands from the start. And then they'll be able to go look at brands profiles and see, okay, um, McDonald's is paying creators of my size niche and engagement rate, a thousand dollars per post. And, you know, uh, L'Oreal is paying creators of my size niche and engagement rate, $2,000 per post. So they can get an idea of how much they should be making with those specific brands. Um, which I think is huge because it's there's not going to be an exact amount that you should be getting paid across the board um, because brand size varies. So for LVMH companies, LVMH has over $150 billion. They're making millions of dollars per day just sitting there. So they are able to pay creators a lot more than a mid-sized indie brand or even a a slightly larger maybe alter sephora brand um so i think it's important to show what the that brand is able to do for influencers of your size um and just giving people that information and access to the brands right off the bat instead of them having to suffer through those early stages of accepting unfortunate brand deals so let's talk about some of those those uh, those ones that you accepted what would you have done differently in those situations we don't have to say any any brand names but you know if you could look at one that you were like yeah they kind of they kind of um got the best of me on that on that one like what would you have done differently in that situation the biggest thing i would do differently in the beginning so without influent in existence at this point <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you I... would have signed up to influent and exactly. yeah yeah <laughs> Um, no, so I, I would have been a, a little bit more careful about which brands I even spent time talking to because it's easy to get sucked into, oh my gosh, one or two new brand deals is popping up in my inbox every single day. And at that point I only had, I don't know, I think 50,000 followers on TikTok when they started popping up. Um, yeah, so, so it was pretty early when I, I started getting more brand deals than I could could handle just because TikTok creators are in really high demand right now. Um, so my first adv- advice that I would give would be to go through all the brand deals that are in your inbox and don't even bother negotiating with half of them. Because if it's not super on brand, your audience is going to see through it. You're not going to accomplish anything for the brand or for yourself. So don't waste time negotiating there and then take the brand deals that are more on brand with products that you're excited about or you already use and negotiate with them to get paid what you're actually worth. You'll end up making more money that way. You'll stay sane um, and your audience will thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And you're building a relationship. Like you're, you're focusing less on it being a transaction and more of a long-term relationship with people that you see yourself working with when you have 100,000, 200,000. Mm-hmm. I always advise to brands that they meet with the creators that they want to work with because a few partnerships I took in the beginning where brands were like, here's our app, go make a video about it and just instantly paid me. And I just made a quick TikTok about it. Uh, Those were not lasting relationships. And although I created what felt like the best video I could create for them, um, all of my partnerships where I actually know some at least one person on the team, I have a better idea of their vision, of the features that their audience loves about yep. their product. Um, I, I have vested interest in their success. So always meet with your creators. Yep, yep. Yeah, you know what their specific goals are, what their mm-hmm. future campaigns are, their messaging. Exactly. Uh, it's so key. And I think so I, I think I told you before I, I come from like the more of the freelancer background and you know, all of the, there's a lot of overlap, you know, you talked about how it's kind of the gig economy. It's just Mm -hmm. a different type of deliverable that you're, you're, that you're giving, but it's a lot of the same questions, you know, in these conversations, I want to know what their goals are, what their budget is, what their future, um, like who else they've collaborated what what, what collaborations made it a success for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm asking a lot of the similar questions. It's just, the beauty is I'm not just giving them the video. It goes on my platform and I'm not, you know, it goes towards, 
my credibility as a creator, as someone that, that is able to, to have, influence and, and and connect with like-minded people about products that i actually love so is when you were working with these were, were most of these products like things that you actually used or were they some where not, not so as much that the money was right and you were just like yeah well, it, it's a, I'll, I'll bend for this one because i feel like there might be some instances where they're like yeah yeah tom come eat this this big mac and uh <laughs> i'll give you 10 grand i don't know i don't know <laughs> um so <laughs> that's a great question um there were a couple brands in the beginning um i i've worked with a lot of apps like any brands where they're trying to acquire creators. That's usually a really good fit for me because I have yeah. a creator heavy audience. Um, and I worked with a couple where I was like, I'm going to, I love the people at this app and I'm going to try and like it and their features and try and like, see what they see. You um, want to like it. Like, you, yeah, like, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and so, but like those partnerships, they're, they're okay. They just, they do, don't do as well. I just recently got a really cool partnership um, with a, a brand that I'm like really excited about can help creators. Like I, I think it's so on brand um, and amazing and has paid me better than a lot of other partnerships. Um, so nice. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I met with them. Okay. They're doing just everything perfectly and I'm not, <laughs> do we want to name drop them or not? Is, uh, that, not, is that not part of the contract? <laughs> uh, this is not part of my contract, but I can still say good things about their team, I think, but okay. um, Contra, cool. So okay. what do they what do they offer? Um, so they're Upwork and Fiverr for creators, but they're not charging creators at all. Like that's not the way that they're monetizing. They're making it free for creators to um, connect and, and do, you know, like creator generated, user generated type content for brands. Um, I think there's a huge need for that right now brands especially since tiktok has blown up they've kind of been struggling with their content creation they need that authentic user generated stuff um so i think it's perfect and i think it serves creators really well and their team has been amazing they scheduled a meeting with me um i got to talk to someone about their future their their goals their upcoming campaigns all of that and then they're they've been extremely organized so they have all the creators in a slack channel together they have us using notion everything has been done but i mean beyond how i could even advise like so i i feel that the behind the scenes with the content creators is just as important as how much you're offering to pay them or how many influencers you work with because all of the influencers now like there's kind of a community that they created almost within like the the contra creators and we all we know the team and we're like very vested in their success so i think it's going to go really well you know that's so cool too with what you're doing at influent because you can almost create like a best practices for how these brands should be working with creators Mm -hmm. And everyone's better. Everyone wins. The The creator's happier. The brand gets more money out of – gets more bang for their buck with mm -hmm. what, what they're putting into the creator, and the creator wants to work with them again. So what are some other things? What are you know some other things that if a brand is listening that they should be thinking about when they're onboarding and starting a partnership with a creator? Um, so I think that, uh, again, like creating – having a really personal relationship with the creators is huge. Um, really – being clear about expectations from the beginning is help for, helpful mm. for the brand, but also helpful for the creator. I've worked with a lot of brands who are like, well, let's just leave up all of the creative freedom to the creators. And I love that to an extent, let the creators speak to their audience in a way that feels natural to them. Let's not force them to be QVC salespeople. But I also think that giving them boundaries can be really helpful. So just saying, mm -hmm. we want you to emphasize these features. Tell your creators what your customers love about your product. That's been really helpful to me. Um, and yep. then also share content that does well. Um, so with one of the brands that I've worked with, I've asked them to send me other creators' videos that have done particularly well so I can have an idea of what type of style works and what type of... Um, what features I should be emphasizing to resonate with the the audience. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm going to clip that and just, uh, I'll, I'll probably have to put a version of that out on my TikTok or a clip of that, <laughs> but then also just send it to brands that 
that reach out to me. Hey, make sure you're doing these things. If, if, if you can check all these boxes, we'll keep this conversation going. For sure. Everyone wins. Everyone wins. Okay, real quick. A question about how do you value your your audience? You know, because you see a lot of these stats out here. I just saw it on – I made a video about it. Influencer Marketing Factor, Factory just put out – you know, they did like a survey of all uh, – how, how creators make money. And there, I mean, there's a lot of examples where people with smaller niche followings are making the same amount of money as people with 5 million followers. So how do you go to a brand and like how, how are you going to help measure that with Influent and what's the number or the metrics that you're looking at to be able to say, yeah, I'm making an impact. Like what do I need to show a brand to say, hey, you know, there's people here that really care about this. This isn't just, a, you know, a random uh, snapshot of the world. This is people here for what you guys offer. Mm. So I think if you're a creator and the main way that you want to monetize is through brand deals, you should be talking about the brands you love ahead of searching for partnerships. I think that something that is not emphasized enough at all is the fact that, so people are always looking for like, what is the best way to measure uh, results with influencer marketing and get better at predicting what's going to work. And, you know, they're always looking at following size and niche and posting time and all these different metrics. When I think what they really need to be looking at is how well primed is the audience to see this content. So by priming your audience to see content about a particular brand, not only is your audience going to not flinch at the content, they're not going to be like, what, where is this coming from? But they're going to be excited for you for getting a partnership with a brand you already love. A perfect example of this is Tinks or it's me Tinks. She talked all the time about her favorite Kiehl's face mask or how much she loved Chipotle And now she's partnered with both of those brands and her audience consumes that content and gives it just as much love as all of her other content because they're just like, go Tinks, you've got partnerships with your favorite brands. It's not like you sold out. I love that. Honestly, so you have a a creator group, a Discord group, and I'm in it. And in one of the first calls, I brought up um, this, this giveaway that AppSumo was doing. And AppSumo is someone, you know, I, I was working with them as a, more of consulting. I wasn't working them as, as an actual partner. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, like, genuinely felt myself telling friends about this thing. Like, even, you know, I was just like, I'm just excited. And I was, I was doing it before I was even working with them. And then after that, that, that call, I was like, you know, I should just make a video about it. You know, I'm, I, like, I really think that it's a good opportunity for people. You know, why, why don't I just say it to the camera? And I sent mm-hmm. it to the camera and it got like all these shares. Uh, Noah Kagan ended up putting it in his email list and like blasting it to all his followers. Oh, cool. And they're, th- then their company reached out to me and said, hey, can we use this as an ad? So they're using it as an ad now. And r- I was just like, oh, I just really just wanted to share. I just thought like it's something that I thought was a good opportunity for creators. So I started mm-hmm. doing more of that when I see books or other tools. Yo, know, I just like. And then eventually people are going to say, oh, I see the response because mm-hmm. it, it's twofold. Like one, I do think the, I mean, these tools make our lives easier as creators. So I want to say like, yo, if this thing's helping me in some way, I want to, if it's, a, if I read one quote from a book, I want to tell you if mm-hmm. Riverside, what I'm podcasting on is making our interview quality b- better to make better content. And I want to tell you, you know, so this stuff I get ex- I geek out about. So I naturally try to incorporate it, but now I have these case studies when brands mm-hmm. come to me, I'm like, Hey, this is the time I said these five tools you can't not use, and it has twenty thousand views and like ten, like not, not ten thousand shares, but a lot of shares, right? So yeah. they can see, they can think of their product in uh, in my content. They can visualize it, and then I, I don't know. Hopefully, they're they're more prone to want to do a partnership. Absolutely, I th- when you're pitching brands, that's really huge. Not only. If you can provide examples for them, specific examples of other similar content that has performed well, that's really helpful. But just painting a picture in general and saying, this is the way I usually talk to my audience. And I think this is a great way for me to incorporate your brand into my content creation style. And painting that picture for brands can be really powerful for influencers and it can get you paid a lot more than if you just say, hey, pay me to make a video. Yes. 
<laughs> exactly. They they want to see what it would be like. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, okay. So if I'm in, are, are pitch decks still a thing? Do people still do pitch decks? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. What, what's a, what's like, what's like the three foundational rules for like what you need to see? What would a pitch deck has to be? Is it like one page? Is there a certain number I need to see on there? Like what do I need to include in that pitch deck? So are you an influencer pitching a brand? Yes. Okay. So I actually don't think you need to go that hard as a creator okay. pitching a brand. I think that the best thing to do is keep a media kit, make sure that it is up to date. You should refresh it every week or two and include as many specific examples of your content as you can um, that will be relevant to the brand. Uh, so include past partnerships. Um, if you have data on how much your discount codes have been used, that all of that kind of stuff yep. is helpful. Um, and just really giving them examples and showing them what your past partnerships have looked like so that they can see what you do for brands. That's helpful. So send them that media kit. And then when you're pitching so, them, so, so mm -hmm. I interrupt. So it's a media kit and not a pitch deck. I use the, it, a pitch deck would be more for like a startup trying to get money. Yes. Yeah. Media kits for influencer <laughs> trying to get money. All right, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, same concept, just shorter yeah, for yeah. the influencer. Yeah, totally. Um, and then I think that all you need to do for the actual pitch portion as a creator is put a little bulleted list or, or a numbered list and, and tell them basically the reasons that you want to work with them. Say, I already love your brand. I've mentioned it on my stories before and it got great engagement. Or I made a video in the past talking about um, the best tools for editing photos and I mentioned your app and everyone loved it or you know something like that yep. if you can. And even if you can't, then I would paint a picture for them and I would say, hey, I'm always giving my audience tips on how they can create better content. So I think that I could partner with you and tell my audience how they could use your app to create better content. And then I might even include a couple quotes on things I would say in the video. Um, and then that has been really successful for negotiating partnerships. I love it. I love it. I hope like... I, I think that, that people are listening to this and they have their pen out and they're taking down everything. And I, I think this is going to be a transformative interview for creators. So uh, thank you for breaking down all these tips. Of course. Now, w w oh, let's touch upon the zero to 10 K. Can mm -hmm. we, can we go into that? What is this program? And also I'm, I'm like, how do you, how are you doing all of this at the same time? <laughs> but I'm, I'm truly impressed, but zero to 10 K, what is, what is the, 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 this program that you're offering for creators? So zero to 10 K started because I was going live a lot in my early TikTok days and people were popping into the comments asking me if they could work with me on their social media growth, on monetizing their platforms, getting better brand deals, uh, all of that. And I wasn't offering anything at the time. And like you were saying, I, there are a lot of scammy course creators and I didn't want to be that. So I was very hesitant to start teaching in a group mm -hmm. setting. Um, but everything is live. So I, I started it in March, didn't do it all summer, and then started it up again last month. So September was the second round. Um, and we're doing another one in October now that starts next week. So it's just you work with me for the month, we meet once a week for a live class session that Gr lasts group session. Yes. Um, yeah. So those are group classes and they're, they're live um, just because I, I considered the pre-recorded thing and I just felt like I couldn't bring as much value um, as I could by teaching in person. Real time. And, yeah, exactly. And then offering Q&A afterwards to address everyone's specific questions. So it's an hour and a half to two hours of instruction and then a Q&A to follow. Um, and the group and, and then everyone's in a slack channel together and then they dm me their content throughout the week on slack and i review it and give them um specific That's tips dope. yeah so um, so yeah what is the four week looks look like so week one is is getting started week two like how, how do you break break up the sections um so week one is i send them a uh, like a welcome workbook um, on how to like how I would like them to get started. And I ask them to create a few pieces of content before the first class so that we have um, they have material with which to actually, you know, ask questions. 
Um, and then I'm actually going to pull up the calendar so I can tell you what we yeah. teach in. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then also, uh -huh. let's you know, is there like a success story that you want to highlight from it? Because I'm sure that you, you've had some breakthrough breakthrough moments from some of the students. I just this morning opened up TikTok and I saw one of my previous students live and I went to click and joined her live. And I don't know when it happened because during class, she, I think she hit 10K like the week after class ended and she was at like a few thousand when it started. That's amazing. It was so cool. I mean, she's very, very talented. I'm not going to pretend to take all the credit, um, yeah, yeah. but I was so excited for her for hitting 10K. I was like, tell me when it happens. I'm reposting it. I'm so excited. And I, I opened it up and she's at 45,000. She had some videos go past a million. I'm like, oh, hey, look at her go. That's amazing. Yeah, it's something about just like having other people do it at the same time as you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if you do have the talent, just like feeling the flow of other people kind of on their grind doing it, the little nuances you can learn from them. I think it's so helpful. So the, the whole breakdown, the four weeks is... Um, and the level of people coming in, it's like people just getting started, right? It's zero to 10 K it's, it's in the name. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually a mix though. I've, I've had a few okay. creators at this point come through with significant Instagram followings to start or, yep. um, and, and they're trying to grow on TikTok, or, um, maybe even they have a, a decent TikTok following, but they're just trying to get past a plateau. Um, yep. so the way that I, I, I break it down is in the beginning, we're really focused on identifying their ideal target follower, because I think that's invaluable when you're going to decide what type of content you're going to create. And a lot of people miss that first step. They're just like kind of throwing yep. stuff out there. Um, so I help them define that. And then I help them define their content pillars. What are basically the three types of content that I'm going to focus on and making sure that those appeal to that ideal follower. And then we get into the content creation portion, which is where I bring out the spreadsheets. We talk about, I've put all my TikTok content into a spreadsheet um, back, I don't know, a few months ago. And I analyzed it by what am I saying in the beginning of the video? Like do our common hooks performing the best? What length video, what pace, uh, do the jump cuts perform better? Or do the single take videos perform better? And I break down all of that and use that to help them create content that's more likely to resonate. Um, so you can just tell that for TikTok, the, the punchier, faster paced content tends to perform better in almost every niche. So I help them apply that to their niches. Um, and then toward the end, we talk more about monetizing, negotiating brand deals, reaching out, um, integrating your business, that kind of thing. This is fantastic. <laughs> so before we, we go into some more tips around it, where can they go if they're interested in this and want to see the sales page? So it's me, Jules, um, on TikTok or Instagram. It's me. It's is ITX. So ITX me Jules. Um, and then it's linked in both of my bios. So you can see the zero to 10 K course and all the information about it there. Cool. And if you sign up, make sure you say, I heard you on the creators, our brands podcast. And it was <laughs> a great it. episode. Um, do, do you mind? Can we touch like five things? What, what like five things that creators need to know about getting seen on TikTok? Uh, whether and and let's talk about the content creation part of it, like what you can't not include <laughs> include in your video. You, you, you touch upon the hook, the jump cuts. Like, what are some things that are top of mind mm -hmm. that um, that we can share? And, and a lot of this is on her her TikTok too. But since you're here, let's give you a little a preview if we can. Yeah, so I would say that eighty to ninety percent of your video performance comes from your hook. So make sure that you have a really, really compelling hook. It's the best creators are those who can put themselves in the shoes of the viewer. So think about what makes you scroll on TikTok. It's generally stuff that's not off to a fast enough start. They don't mention something that appeals to you in the very beginning of the video. You scroll right past it. Um, prerequisites, of course, are having nice lighting, um, clear view of your face or whatever you're trying to show. Um, so the first sentence of your video is super, super important to your performance, including the word you in the first sentence is really impactful. Um, mm -hmm. And really just directing all of your content toward the viewer and, and thinking about how you can bring them value as opposed to talking about yourself, even if you're talking about something you love. So maybe you're a fitness creator and you love working out. You want to say, here's how you can shave 30 seconds off of your mile, you know, or, you know, give them a really specific value add. So 
that was a, a good example. You want to be really specific about the outcome they'll get from watching your video. Mm, so that gives them the incentive. To watch. See, that's something that I think I, I can start including. I do the hook, like the question, mm -hmm. but I don't say the, the outcome. And you, you want to try to package that into, into that hook in that first, what, mm -hmm. three Three seconds? Three seconds. Yeah, that's a, a, you really honestly have one to three seconds to catch people's attention. And everyone, just humans in general, are very outcome based. They're very what's in it for me. So if you can instantly tell them what outcome they'll achieve through just watching your video, they'll stop scrolling. Cool. All right. So now you get, a, you get them through the hook. Is there, do, are one takes better or is there like a pacing? of your delivery that you're trying to focus on how many cuts what i know you got I, you said you broke down all your videos so i know yeah. you got the analytics <laughs> jump cuts uh outperform single take videos significantly which is great mm. news for people like me who are regularly tongue-tied so you only have to get like one or two sentences right at a time and you can cut um so five clips is a sweet spot one intro three body clips and an outro. It's just like a third grade essay. Um, and your first clip should just include that hook, maybe one other quick thing about what you're about to get into. And then each clip should really only be one to two sentences. More than that, you'll overwhelm people. Um, people really like numbered lists. So here are three ways to double, like to up your story engagement on Instagram. Um, People like, again, just like the really clear outcomes within it for me play into people's desire for instant gratification. So if you're a fitness creator, instead of saying, here's how you can achieve a whatever seven minute mile in a six months of running uh, and preparing for a marathon, I don't know. Um, you don't want to give them long timelines. You want to say, here's how you can have more energy this month or next month. Um, I I think those are the biggest that, tips. So I I love it. I love it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start implementing some of these because I feel like my content is I'm like like there's so many where I'm like I know that this video is so close to popping off. Like the yeah. content's good. It feels good. I know it's helpful. I know people are responding to it. Like I'm getting like responses, but like I feel like I'm missing the for you page by like a half a second. So I want to incorporate some of this stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, the first time you popped up on my for you page, I went to your profile expecting to see like a million followers and I was like, "Oh, I was like, well, he makes really great content for being so like early. <laughs> for being a dud. Like, <laughs> yeah. no. no, but you can tell yeah, that people you're, say like, that really a lot. Close. Yeah, yeah. People say that a lot. I didn't start taking it seriously until about three months ago. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of throwing my leftovers up on TikTok. And yeah. then in the last, starting probably in July, I was like, I like this platform. I'm sold on this platform. So I started really like putting the blinders on and focusing on it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that like breaking down the content, the way that you do is mm -hmm. so helpful. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to incorporate some of that. Now, um, I, I'm stoked for people to hear this interview. I'm stoked for potential investors, brands, and, <laughs> and creators <laughs> to hear this because you're coming at it from all angles. So thank you so much for, for being on the show. Where do you want to, to send people? Is it the same place? It's me, Jules. Um, TikTok, yeah. Instagram. Yeah, definitely. Um, the only other place to go is if you're a content creator and you want to see brand reviews, see what other creators are getting paid, then go to influentgen.com cool and now, leave reviews to help other creators uh, amazing uh, so we can start using it now uh yes you get it. the biggest thing that you can do to help bring the platform to life is to leave reviews talk about the brand deals that you've had and you don't have to leave long written reviews but just say what you what brand you worked with what platform and how much you got paid um that is huge right now amazing now it's a it's a year from the release of this podcast what is one thing that you are proud of that you've that you've built in the business with with influent like what's a success what's a win that happened in in the in the year of building this oh boy <laughs> um well 
hopefully Influent at that point is already becoming um, a place that creators visit on a daily basis to see new brand deals that have popped up, um, any updates in the rates that they can be charging and just kind of um, making influencers lives better. Um, I, I'm hoping that by that point, we were already able to provide that for, for creators. Amazing. Jules, thank you so much for being on the show. If there's any way that we can help you do help in the process of getting to that point, please let me know. I'm excited to share this with the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.